From the earliest times I can remember, I wanted to be a writer. I was told that to be a good writer, one should write about what he cares for most passionately. That was my family, and I wrote about them in my novel, Spencer's Mountain, and in a later novel, The Homecoming. Welcome to another segment of Behind the Scenes of the Waltons. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the show's creator, Earl Hamner Jr. If you're enjoying these, please like and subscribe and hit that notification bell. I first met Earl Hamner when I auditioned for the role of Mary Ellen in The Homecoming. Uh, that audition took place at CBS Studios in Studio City. Earl was there along with the producer, director Fielder Cook, casting director Pam Palafroni. There were just, I remember, a number of adults in that room, but Earl was distinctive with his soft, gentle Virginia accent. I got to know Earl a little bit during the filming of The Homecoming because he was around a lot. And then when we went to Jackson Hole, Wyoming to film all of the snow sequences for the last week of The Homecoming, Earl was there and he brought along his wife, Jane, and his children, Scott and Carrie. So I had a chance to meet and get to know a little bit his whole family. They're very, they're a lovely family. Earl, of course, grew up in Virginia. The Hamner House is still there. It is now a landmark. It is a tourist attraction. During the time that Earl's mother was still living, people would stop by the house and knock on the door and she would come out and she would share stories, let them see the house. And from what I understand was incredibly gracious. I had a chance to meet Doris Hamner a number of times during the course of the series and she was, she was lovely. Earl's father had already passed by the time we started filming the show, so I never had a chance to meet him. I did meet the majority of his brothers and sisters. Of course, he came from a family of eight children, not seven. Two of his brothers were condensed for the homecoming into the character of Ben. I think they felt that seven children was enough. <laughs> I'm not sure how Earl's mother felt about that, <laughs> but it seemed to work for the series. Earl did grow up wanting to be a writer, and then uh, he went to New York, very much like John Boy did, and wrote, I believe, for radio and, and perhaps um, some live stuff there, and then moved out to Hollywood and started writing for film and television. Uh, many people have commented uh, about him writing episodes of various different shows, including The Twilight Zone. Um, and then he had the opportunity, based on the book Spencer's Mountain, to have that movie made about his a version of his family. Um, and Henry Fonda and Maureen O'Hara played his parents, and there um, was a whole family of children. So I have seen that movie. It's been some years since, since I saw it. Uh, the character names were different there. And in fact, when we first auditioned for The Homecoming, the characters in the ori original script that I saw were different. My character was originally Becky. Um, Elizabeth's character was originally Patty Cake. Uh, so uh, I think there were some rights issues involved because of Spencer's Mountain. So all of the names were changed from Spencer to Walton and then all of the um, all of the children's names were, were changed. Earl went from having done Spencer's Mountain and then created The Homecoming, which was a book, and then the TV movie, The Christmas Special, and then of course became the series, The Waltons. So his he wrote about his own life and many things that were accurate about his, his childhood growing up in rural Virginia. But much of what was told during the series was then fictionalized, was uh, some characters were based on actual people from Earl's youth, uh, but in many cases it was it was all invented. Earl also wrote the movie Charlotte's Web. He wrote um, for other series that were created. He created the series Falcon Crest, which was a far cry from the family on the Waltons. <laughs> but it just goes to show that he, the scope of his talent as a writer. In fact, in after the after the Waltons, there was a point in time where I saw a movie, a TV movie that he had written, and I watched it, and it was so beautiful that I I was moved to call Earl and tell him how touched I was by this story he had told, and what a beautiful writer he was. I I always appreciated his writing, 
So um, I think he, he appreciated that phone call. I hope so, because it was very heartfelt on my part. We did feel at times that Earl viewed his family and his childhood with rose-colored glasses. <laughs> and sometimes we we talked about how, particularly like with his mother, Michael felt that she couldn't play his mother as perfectly as, you know, she didn't want his mother to be as perfect as Earl perhaps wanted to portray her. And we sort of understood that, that his mother was still living and I'm sure there was a little bit of dynamic there about perhaps Earl's concern about how his mother might view storylines or things in how she was being portrayed. But both Michael and Ellen Corby in playing the grandmother sometimes pushed back a bit in their desire to have there be more dynamic and more layers to these characters that, that they didn't come off too perfect. Earl was good natured about that, and and uh, I think, oh, you know, he had mixed feelings at times. But uh, I never saw Earl, you know, really lose his temper, or he was always such a gentleman, and he had a wicked sense of humor. Uh, so it was it was a real joy to help bring his childhood to life. As far as the narration goes, uh, originally they auditioned countless actors in Hollywood to do that voice narration. And of course, that Virginia, soft Virginia accent is very distinctive. And at some point, someone said, well, Earl, why don't you do it? And of course, it couldn't have been more perfect, uh, you know, to hear all of that in his voice at, at the, you know, at the beginning and the end of each episode just is iconic as those Walton good nights and leaves us with such a beautiful legacy from the man who created it. And Earl then in fact did appear in a couple of episodes. He appeared in the retrospective we did a decade of the Waltons where you actually physically see him on camera and walking through the Walton house, uh, the set of the Walton house. And then also in the episode from season two, The Journey, where uh, he in a flashback dances with the woman that John Boy has taken on that journey. And as she remembers um, from her youth, Earl Hamner is the one with the mutton chops <laughs> dancing with her. So a beautiful moment um, and nice to see Earl have a moment here and there on camera. Speaking of Earl's writing, I thought it only fitting that I share some of his actual words with you from his book, Good Night John Boy. If you haven't read this, highly recommend it talks about the Walton, Spencer's Mountain, the homecoming, and it is often a source for some of my research for these video segments. This is his preface. The great North Carolina novelist Thomas Wolfe said, you can't go home again, but that has not been my experience. Even though home is far away, I go there often, not to the hillside house in Studio City, California, where I live with my wife, but to my home as a youngster some 50 years and 3,000 miles away in the misted blue hills and valleys of Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains. My journey begins in Burbank at a movie studio. The fading light of day still tends the California gloaming. I drive through the back lot, a curious landscape, a Mexican settlement where water sprinkles in a deserted fountain, a Tibetan village where fake cherry blossoms cling to the tips of stage trees, a Midwestern village square where a silent bandstand echoes lost and forgotten march music. The darkened Western street where ghosts of movie gunslingers and cowboys seem to linger in the gathering dusk. I come finally to a country lane, unpaved and bordered with green trees. I cross a road puddle, follow the turning road, and I am home again. The house is a stage set, a shell, but a replica of the house I lived in as a child. It is a typical rural Virginia house, two-storied and white, built of clapboard. It rests in a wood. An old wooden barn stands nearby. Evening winds fan white curtains at the windows and shadows loom in non-existent rooms behind the facade. A porch extends the length of the house. A friendly wicker chair, a porch swing, and hanging baskets of flowers give the illusion of occupancy. I stop the car, turn off the engine, and listen to those creatures astir at that darkening hour. A stranger, distant and watching, 
I see myself and the children we were drift across the damp grass and go into the house. We were eight and I was the eldest. We all had red hair and my father called us his thoroughbreds. Standing together, we made stair steps, a row of lean, small boned children who were living through a depression but rarely knew what it was to be depressed. We knew we were loved because our mother and father loved each other and passed that love on to each of us. This is the family I recreated in my books and on television, my brothers and sisters, my mother and father, my grandparents, as we were during the depression years of the 30s. Sometimes watching the scene makes the memories of childhood return with such force and clarity that it brings tears to my eyes. Darkness falls and once again, a stranger before the facade of a building on the back lot at Warner Brothers, I hear the slap of the screen door closing, the children all safe inside to do homework, to listen to Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy on the radio and to prepare for bed. After the last light is out, they call to each other. Good night, Cliff. Good night, Audrey. Good night, Marion. Good night, Mama. Good night, Daddy. Good night, Paul. Good night, Bill. Good night, Jim. Good night, Nancy. Good night, Earl. Their voices fade into time and memory. I am alone and I am refreshed and comforted. I ease the car away past the sleeping Mexican square, the Tibetan village, and the Midwestern street toward the California hillside where my wife waits for me. And when they hear my car pull into the driveway, the Bob Whites will make their plaintive and mysterious call. Thank you for sharing this memory of Earl Hamner Jr. with me. I miss him every day, but he lives on through all those wonderful episodes of The Waltons, which I'm so proud to have been a part of. Good night, Earl. And I will see you all on more episodes of Behind the Scenes of the Waltons and more Ask Judy. Thanks for watching.